So Stephen, you were um, uh, on your way to becoming a documentary filmmaker in Texas, and you got a call to work on a documentary by an interesting guy by the name of Ken Burns. Uh, and that, that was a, a big moment to, to be a witness of. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I sort of joined uh, Ken actually in a uh, bed and breakfast in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, and he was in the middle of making this obscure project called The Civil War, which uh, none of us had really thought was going to be anything more than a little PBS, you know, uh, multi-part series. And um, I was in this bed and breakfast, and I ended up uh, late that first night sitting around with this uh, elderly, soft-spoken gentleman drinking Jack Daniels. And I found out, uh, you know, and his name was Shelby Foote. And he turned out to be this storyteller that transfixed America. Uh, over the course of that Civil War series. Um, he became a sex symbol in, in some strange way to um, many of those uh, uh, middle-aged PBS women who were watching the Civil War series. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it was a great uh, example to me of plunging right into the middle of what made Ken's work so interesting, which was um, just an ability to dig deeply into the fabric of American history and, and find these amazing stories. And so it was a, it was a great baptism. And looking back uh, over the world that the Civil War series uh, landed in, what has changed over that 25-year that period in the world of documentary filmmaking? Well, I was always just the only documentary filmmaker at any cocktail party. It was a great, you know, sort of, oh, yeah, that's what I do now. Everybody is a documentary filmmaker, um, which is really annoying on one level. Um, but it's been an incredible thing to watch. Uh, the technology is a huge part of it. Uh, the explosion of these digital platforms make the barriers that were so huge when I was starting out simply non-existent. I mean, it would cost you tens of thousands of dollars to get an ancient film camera and go out and try and shoot film. Every 11 minutes of film cost me $500 when I was starting out. Uh, now anyone can pick up a, a camera, and the profusion of forms has been incredibly healthy, I think. I mean, just, just scanning on the uh, Times website on Vimeo's editor's picks, I mean, you're seeing a level of storytelling that is, is just exhilarating. At the same time, it's also uh, had, I think, some some negative effects in that, you know, in a way we've transferred from a tyranny of time to a tyranny of choice. I mean, it took us so long to make these films originally that you actually had time to think about what you were doing. Um, and now you can pretty much create multiple versions of anything that you're working on um, and just because you have 15 versions of your rough cut doesn't make it any good. Um, and I think that there has tended to be a kind of substitute, a substitution of flash and new digital toys for some of the things that actually go into making something watchable. Um, and so as an old curmudgeon uh, who's kind of looking at the way this has evolved, um, I sometimes see uh, a, a wish for a little bit more uh, limitations. Sometimes having a limitation forces you into a creative place that you wouldn't otherwise go. And when you're, you're uh, completely liberated and you can do anything you want, um, sometimes the, the, the solution or the, the end result is, is more paralysis than uh, inspiration sometimes, I think. What have you seen as the <clears throat> biggest stylistic innovations over that time? Uh, there's a piece, I think, in today's New York Times about animation in documentary film. These technologies and also just creativity have opened up a couple of uh, varieties of approaches. And have you seen that change over time? Yeah, I mean, for specifically for what I do um, in historical films, uh, we've been able to do kind of theatrical reenactments, for example, um, that have um, really opened up the world that we live in. I mean, Ken has remained true, like this North Star of the documentary, historical documentary. He hasn't changed his approach in, in fundamentally in, in 25 years. And I give him great credit for that. I mean, he's stayed completely true to the form that he helped invent. There aren't a lot of other 
sort of filmmakers that have an effect on Final Cut Pro named after them. Yeah, an iPhoto, uh, like I, an I'll iPhoto, do my yeah. Show. There's a Ken Burns effect on That's iPhoto. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm Ken Burns. I'm in a Ken That's Burns. That's a little movie. fast, actually. Oh, gosh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Slow down a little bit. Okay. Okay, good. We could, we could all do it together a little bit later. Uh, yeah. Um, but so one of the things that's been really exciting and interesting for us as historical filmmakers is trying to break open that world that kind of often makes you feel trapped in a box. And you know, we have a clip that maybe we could show about that. I, I did a film about uh, James Earl Ray uh, and Martin Luther King. And um, the challenge of that was, of course, that King was one of the most well-represented figures of the 1960s, and Ray, his assassin, spent his entire life trying to be invisible. So how do you do a film that conveys the sort of fateful connection between these two men as they're moving towards Memphis, where King has gone to try and uh, resolve, oddly enough, a garbage strike. No one realizes he was killed on trying to help garbage workers in Memphis. So I think we have a, about that one minute clip we just grabbed from my film Roads to Memphis, so maybe we could just show that. Great. So what were we actually seeing there? That was um, not, I assume, primary source footage of James Earl Roy Ray's CD hotel room. Uh, yeah, what we did was we took an actor and we built all these sleazy flop house environments where he was living on his way towards this fateful meeting with King. And then we tried to keep the historical narrative going by in every location where he was, and this was actually what he did. He had TVs in all of his rooms. We kept bringing in some of the footage that would have been on the local newscast. And he got more and more incensed by watching what King was doing as he got closer and closer to Memphis. So it was a way of trying to keep the two men in connection and in tension with one another without really having the material to make one of them um, come alive in quite the same way. Yeah. So. One of the things I think is, is um, makes those choices seem worth making uh, when they could potentially risky, uh, risk being inauthentic is that they seem to connect to a deep story that you found in, for instance, the story of these two men and uh, the, the invisibility of James Earl Ray, which comes through from just seeing him, never seeing the actor's face, um, the uh, lighting and the, uh, the imagery of someone on TV famous and someone obscure with no resources. Um, so how, how do you, uh, judge your choices as you make films uh, so that they're always st uh, sticking to the story that you're trying to tell? Well, I think, you know, ultimately you have to feel some sense of being honorable, if, that, if that's a sort of odd word, a very old-fashioned word, but it, it, to your subject, that, that um, you have to feel like you are embracing as much of the ambiguity and the complexity of these situations as you can possibly find. I think that Americans, we love to have, to have a belief in American exceptionalism. Uh, we are an extraordinary culture, an extraordinary country. I think that's led to a kind of mythologizing, a kind of sanitizing of our own history. We like stories that are tied up in neat bows and cardboard cutouts that Hollywood has helped us shape sometimes. And I think that more than anything else, you have to embrace the deep flaws often in these great characters. I mean, I, uh, I've been drawn to jo George Armstrong Custer, to Charles Lindbergh, even, and of course to Martin Luther King. It's this immensely flawed person 
who, whose weaknesses make him all the more extraordinary to me, to have been able to have lived through the months that he lived through leading up to that fateful moment in Memphis is to me what makes him utterly you know, riveting. So I think that that's, that's my lesson for, regardless of the, whether you're shooting on a GoPro or um, you've grabbed the latest gizmo off the, off the, the shelf, you have to be clear-eyed uh, about what your subject has really uh, meant. And, and I think that that sounds sort of simplistic on one level, but it's much harder than you might think to, to give someone their, their fair due, you know. And as a storyteller, is it your job to uh, express a point of view clearly and use those tools to move your audience toward a goal, or can you strive towards being objective in some way? Well, I mean, I think obje objectivity is, is sort of the death of good storytelling. Uh, actually, in some ways. I mean, it's one thing if you're uh, a news reporter trying to get the facts straight about an, an, an evolving story, and that, that's different. But if you're, if you're trying to go and actually craft a, a version of events, by telling it your way, you are expressing a point of view. You are embracing a, a way of, uh, of collating and sorting through this complicated history that we all live with. And don't hold back on that. I mean, there's nothing worse, no offense, but to, to, than the news hour. You know, the point, counterpoint, everybody's got their own point of view and no point of view ever rises to the top. I mean, I think ultimately you have to believe in uh, your version of events. That is what makes it interesting to you and that's what's gonna make it interesting to your audience. Uh, I'm so interested I could keep talking, but we're, uh, we are very thankful, Stephen Ives, for you joining us here at TEDx Beacon Street. Thank you so much. Thank you.